This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. Welcome to this episode of the One Thing Podcast. This is a highlight of my career. I get to interview Dr. Mark Pimentel from Cedar sinais Gastroenterology Division. He has been someone who's been instrumental in my career. I'm so delighted to bring him here to you. We just had a delightful conversation uh, talking about many things, such as the last five years of Dr. Pimentel's career and how his research and SIBO and irritable bowel syndrome has influenced him in the last five years. We talk about things such as what it was like to treat IBS back when he first started his career over 27 years ago. We go into some of the latest topics such as uh, hydrogen sulfide, SIBO, intestinal methane overgrowth, and how methanogenesis is produced. We talk about stomach acid and how that relates with IBS. We talk about the connection between bile acids and IBS. We go into post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome and just explore what's involved with that scenario and how post-infectious IBS is evaluated. Um, We go into many of the research, the research about specific species that are now being associated with different forms of IBS and SIBO. So there's three subtypes where we've identified the keystone species that are involved with these imbalances. And that's exciting news for all of us who are helping patients with irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO and trying to help them get their life back and get to feeling more well. So this is a, was a really instrumental conversation in understanding 2022 and where we're at in the, in the research. And um, I hope you enjoy this episode. For those of you who are dealing with SIBO or IBS, I think you'll find this information current and useful. And for those of you who are treating these conditions, I think you'll find Dr. Pimentel's information, something that you can apply right away in your clinical practice. So without further ado, welcome to the next episode of the One Thing Podcast. Dr. Pimentel, welcome to the One Thing Podcast. It's such an honor to have you here today. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Uh, I was telling, uh, mentioning to you off the air, and most of my patients know this, that that you you are definitely changed my career for the better. And um, back in 2007, um, things really took off after learning from you and learning uh, and starting to study your work. So I just thank you and my patients thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your hard work and dedication. You know, it's been a great ride. And, uh, and uh, as, as we said offline also, it's not about us. It's about our patients getting better. And so hopefully there's more to come. Yes, definitely. So I'd love to get into hearing about the last five years of your career because I've been following your work and, wow, it's really – things have really started um, taking off um, in this field more and more. Probably for you, it, it probably seems like a, a really long process to get here, but I'd love to hear about the last five years because I've just noticed some a uh, big turning point in your research and in your work um, and just like to kind of know how things changed for you in your career. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to do the last five years. So it's going to reflect for two seconds, you know, 26 years ago when I started thinking about the microbiome and its relationship to functional GI disorders, particularly irritable bowel syndrome, and connecting SIBO to IBS. 
Wow, it's controversial. Uh, you know, we're talking about a disease that people thought was psychological, and now we're saying it's microbiological. So that was a big uh, switch. And that switch was more of a very, very, very large um, um, dial <laughs> that slowly turns sort or of like a dimmer switch for people to get it. Uh, and, and even though we got it and we were seeing it in our patients, we ourselves must go through the scientific process. Uh, so even if we believe something, you have to prove it, you have to prove it, you have to prove it, you have to prove it. But I, I think we convincingly proved it 10 years ago with Rifaximin being FDA approved and so forth. But it's, it's not this, it wasn't the full story. I think we needed to understand why IBS is developing to begin with. Like what, what's going on here? Um, and I'm just trying to shut things down so I don't make any beeps all over the place here. But, um, yeah, we, how does it all come together? I mean, how does SIBO form? Because if we really want to cure SIBO, antibiotics aren't the answer. They're an answer for the time. And, and I think that's what the last five years has got us is we now know that food poisoning started this whole thing. Now we know the toxin that does it. Now we're trying to find a mechanism how that toxin is doing it. And then by putting that together with the SIBO, uh, I think that's that's huge. And then the sequencing that we've been doing to try to identify, because people say, well, okay, you already proved it, SIBO. You already proved it, SIBO. But no, it's not like that. We're now down to three or four strains of organisms that are specifically involved in SIBO. Once we get to that level, we're done. We now know the bad actors. And, and when we know the bad actors, it's going to help us with treatments uh, immensely. And we needed to know where they live and we needed to know who they are. Now, same thing with the methanogens. We're now understanding that there are different strains of M. smithii that are producing methane and some are producing it differently than others. So it just opens up new avenues for better treatments that are going to work longer term. So sorry for the long answer, but but it's, it's really been uh, eye-opening even in the last five years. Yeah, yeah. And- you know, I think one of the, some of the highlights that I've really learned a lot from from the last five years, one of them being the IBS smart test. I don't know if that it preceded five years, but that was like a big uh, game changer um, to have that tool. And then adding um, the TRIO smart test with the ability to test for hydrogen sulfide. And now um, some of your latest work on highlighting understanding methanogenesis, I mean, it's, it makes us really uh, be able to have um, good conversations with our patients and educate them and, and develop strategies to help prevent recurrence of these conditions. So those, those are really uh, beneficial. So I, I'd love to kind of even go back even further, because you, you mentioned how when you were starting, um, this was considered, I mean, I remember the term like a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. IBS was sort of a, kind of a waste bucket diagnosis when a clinician had ruled out IBD and other more serious disorders. Of, um, and then you're saying that in the beginning of your career was considered more of a psychological, psychosomatic disorder. Do you remember your first patient, like when you first encountered IBS? What, what was that like? Well, I'll give you two case examples. Um, one of them was <clears throat> this this 50-ish year old gentleman who um, had IBS, was told he had IBS, had been around the block with probably eight or nine gastroenterologists. And we saw him, did a breath test, as primitive as it was at the time, and positive. And we treated him with neomycin, didn't have rifaximin or any of the new stuff. And he came back. He had had it for 20 years and he was angry um, because he says, I can't believe in 10 days you fixed something I've been suffering with for 20 years right. and having seen all these great doctors and he couldn't understand in his head how it's possible that we did something so, quote, easy and yet nobody else thought of it. But but that's how things start, Right. Um, the second example <clears throat> was actually a 65-year-old woman who's again, had had IBS for a couple of decades or so <clears throat> and had been around the block, same story, 
but this time, again, remarkable, 90% improved. But on her second visit, she came in with a brown paper bag, true story. And she literally, in front of me, dumped the bag on the table and she says, this is the stuff they've all given me these years. I don't need the antidepressants anymore. And there was four of those in there. I don't need the the antispasmodic, et cetera, et cetera. The bag was just full of pills from doctor, previous doctors. And so, you know, anecdote isn't science, but it told me that these patients were frustrated with what they were being offered, were frustrated by the side effects of all those things, and could, couldn't believe that they got this kind of relief. So obviously it doesn't happen like that for everybody, but but you, you get the picture that this was a game changer and we started to see that in our patients. Yeah, uh, it, I remember in 2007, I was uh, just out of residency and I was, um, you know, I thought I knew a little bit about helping people with IBS and I had a really difficult case um, of a young man who couldn't travel uh, more than an hour or two before needing to use the restroom. And he was really frustrated. And um, we tried some things. I didn't get a whole lot. Maybe helped him maybe a little bit. And uh, he, you know, he, he said he was going to go talk to a gastroenterologist and get a little more information. And uh, he came back smiling ear to ear on his follow-up visit with me. And he's like, I'm, I'm all better. And uh, I hate I said, well, you know, what did, what, what happened? We you know what, what did they advise you on? What was the diagnosis? What, and uh, he said, I was um, Dr. Sloan, who knows uh, um, Dr. Pimentel in, in Los Angeles, um, gave me this test and it turned out I had this overgrowth. I was given this treatment with Rifaximin and I've never felt better. And uh, it was to me, so then that led down, um, you know, my that kind of started my exploration of SIBO and understanding it more. But, um, yeah, and, you know, of course, um, after that, there was more work to do to help him stay well. Um, but uh, that was that was my first case with, you know, officially with SIBO. Yeah, great story. I mean, there's just you probably have dozens of stories like that uh, and, and the amount of money patients pay out of pocket co-pays for all sorts of things that have been done over the years only to find out that 10 days or 14 days of an antibiotic made them better again these are points of frustration for these patients when they when they sort of get that wake-up call that this just made them so much better and this was the cause so uh yeah a lot a lot to unpack over the 10 20 years yeah so when we think about um that kind of end result of helping people by um, altering the microbiome and kind of reverse engineering that and kind of going backwards and, and seeing like, how did they get here in the first place? I think these are all the questions that you were saying at the beginning of the conversation that we're trying to understand. And I would love to go into a, a few core elements that you've really highlighted um, with your work one being um, just the keystone microbes that set up, which is really fascinating to me. And I want to maybe set this up by saying, you know, that there are, there's a sort of norm, normal environment in the small intestine where certain microbes should thrive and others should not. And we see in uh, SIBO and in EMO, intestinal meth methane overgrowth, that this is different. Like the, the species that are surviving in the small intestine are different. Can you maybe expand upon that as just sort of like a core foundational understanding of, of this uh, imbalance? Yeah, I mean, 26 years ago when, when we defined SIBO, what we said was, and this is written in my own papers, is that the colon bacteria are moving up and overpopulating the small bowel bacteria. And 26 years later... That's not at all what's happening, exactly. Um, it's that there are, are a few key players, E. coli and Klebsiella particularly, those two, that they, when you have the food poisoning and you have the slower transit of the gut, they find it a delicious opportunity 
to take over. And the higher they are, the more we call them disruptors now, because the higher their number, the more they destroy the community. Um, and, and they're just, they're just terrible for the other organisms. And so there's a destruction of the normal microbial communities when E. coli, the higher E. coli and Klebsiella get. Uh, and, and that's the issue. What's remarkable, and you're going to see some more data come out in about four or five months from DDW, that we were able to nail it down to very, very, very specific strains. Uh, so basically, we know the exact organisms, not just it's e e Escherichia or E. coli. We know the exact E. coli. Uh, and, and that's going to be huge. But the point is, it's amazing that if you think about the microbiome, it's a thousand different organisms in the small bowel, maybe it's five or six hundred. And two or three characters are taking up 40% of everything. Um, it's really dramatic. Um, and so in one of the things I said to my research staff a couple of weeks ago as we were preparing for DDW, I said, isn't it amazing that two or three characters can, can do so much damage? And there is nothing in, in our reimagined study of the small bowel. There is no other example of that much destruction of the microbiome in our small bowel samples, short of taking high intensity antibiotics just before getting your sample. So SIBO is highly destructive. In the case of methanogens, they're recruiting more organisms. So there's more diversity of the wrong kind of things. So between methanogens, recruiting the wrong actors to the field and the SIBO, typical SIBO, um, destroying the typical actors where they belong. Um, it's an interesting sort of yin and yang dichotomy between these two examples, which is why, and, and this is something that people, maybe people don't know, people who have methane always relapse methane. We have never, I've, Dr. Razai, I've talked to him, he says he's got one patient, I maybe have one patient in 26 years who was hydrogen and is now methane. So they're either methane or they're not. And, and so um, you get stuck in your bucket. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you also introduced this uh, topic um, or this concept of syntropy in some of your recent papers. And I think that's really important for people to understand because, you know, there's this uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction. It's like, well, let's just kill those bugs and end of story. But this concept concept of syntropy paints a little bit of different of a picture of what's going on. Can you talk about that? Yeah, syntro syntrophs are organisms that depend on other organisms. And so um, think of it like the godfather, right? The godfather <laughs> is there. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gang, but there's a leader. And you need all the henchmen in order to make the leader powerful. And so in the methanogen situation, you need the Christensenolaceae and the Ruminococcaceae to feed the hydrogen to the methanogen in order for methane to be produced and then the patient to feel unwell. And so the methanogen brings in these bugs to help feed it. Another example is uh, what, uh, what's the name of that big character in Star Wars that just keeps eating things? So uh, I can't remember the name. But it's uh, been a while for looks me. like that looks like a big worm. But anyways, uh, um, and just eating constantly. Well, that's the methanogen, and 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 he's just uh, accumulating people around him. So um, that's that's syntrophy, and and uh, you know these organisms have figured this out long ago how to how to make themselves happy. Yeah. So there's uh, basically players that um, cross feed and. Um, support the methanogens um, in their growth. And um, also with the hydrogen sulfide, it seems as though that's, a, that's a, the case as well. Yeah, hydrogen sulfide is, is the new kid, so to speak. It's not the new, new kid, but it's something we're starting to unravel more clearly. It, all, it stems back from, well, if you go back 26 years, part of the controversy of SIBO is that us included, but also many of the other scientists, could never show a relationship between the amount of hydrogen on a breath test and the severity of symptoms. And so there was always this discordance. And so it made scientists say, well, okay, fine, the breath test is positive, but 
Shouldn't it be more symptoms if there's more bugs there, more hydrogen? Uh, but the problem is we were missing that organism class of hydrogen sulfide because hydrogen has no relationship to symptoms like methane. The higher the methane is, more constipation. The higher the hydrogen is, doesn't matter. Uh, mm -hmm. But hydrogen is feeding hydrogen sulfide or sulfate reducing bacteria. And the higher hydrogen sulfide is, the more diarrhea you have. So without knowing that gas, we were missing a whole piece of the puzzle. And now that we've sequenced the small bowel, we're identifying those characters as well. So you could say that the hydrogen is centrophic to the hydrogen sulfide production as well, but we'll continue to dig into that. Yeah. So going into that a little deeper, I, I've seen in some of your recent papers a highlight of um, ruminococcus species being uh, present and a key a keystone species in methanogen patients. And I think there's maybe one other organism that's been highlighted. Um, it's interesting because I know that I've messaged you so many times about me methanogenesis because it's sort of my, uh, the bane of a lot of our patients' existence and it's difficult, challenging. Um, it's interesting that ruminococcus is, uh, is from my understanding, one of these like starch feeders. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated to hear what you're, if, if learning about ruminococcus changed any of your thinking about methanogenesis. Yeah, so the two families are Ruminococcaceae, of which Ruminococcus is part, and Christensenolaceae. Again, they're, they're carbohydrate feeders, as you point out. Uh, they are intense hydrogen producers. So you'll say, well, but when you have methanogens or when you have methane, your hydrogen is actually lower because the methanogens are extremely good at picking up hydrogen and running mm -hmm. with it and producing methane, eating it all up. But they are, they are really doing, um, they're, they're really ch channeling the food products to the methanogens. One of the things we see, uh, and maybe this sort of creates a different controversy about your question, is that if you have methanogens and this carbohydrate digestion, so for example, if you eat a piece of lettuce, humans don't digest lettuce, but these guys might be able to break it down and then liberate calories that go to you. And so we do see when methane's present that people tend to be heavier in weight or more obese. And so by having this ability to digest food products that normally humans don't digest and providing that, that methane, think, think of it this way. Cows do not eat grass. That whole notion, cows eat grass, cows do not eat grass. Cows put grass in their stomach and the bacteria of their gut and the methanogens eat the grass. Then the yeah. cow brings that up, chews the bacteria, and gets the calories from the bacteria. So cows do not digest grass. Um, and I think the same thing is happening in some humans where we're getting calories that we wouldn't have otherwise been capable of, of liberating because of these organisms. The problem is we're sitting at our desks, got the bagel room across the hall, potato chips <laughs> on our desk and candy, and we have meth methanogens who, and, their, and their syntrophs who are just very good at getting calories from that stuff. We're not living on the, you know, the plains hoping for a kill today, you know. So it's uh, it's a different environment. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's really interesting to know, you know, a little bit about what's driving up that much hydrogen. Um, you know, it's just. And the other thing that was fascinating that I saw in, in some of your recent work was that uh, perhaps the lower the stomach acid, the less methanogenesis. Um, that that was uh, fascinating because there's all these naturopathic and integrative and functional medicine, you know, sort of is a, a big uh, promoter of healthy stomach acid. It was I think it was really enlightening to learn that um, we need to be careful about that. Well, yeah, I mean, sodas, although that's not endorsed by anybody, uh, have a lot of acid. A lot of acid-containing foods, like fermented foods, are acid-containing. Um, you know, people are giving betaine, HCL, or hydrochloric acid to people, hoping that it will reduce bacteria, but in fact, it could be doing the opposite, as you say. So, high, methanogens can use hydrogen in many forms. It can get it from ammonium. It can get it from just acid. It can get it from acetate. It can get it from um, 
you know, the hydrogen gas itself. So, so there are many ways and creative ways that methanogens can get, can get hydrogen. So, in fact, if you're giving hydrochloric acid, you may be encouraging bad things among your methanogens. However, getting rid of acid sometimes makes that less. So uh, it's, it's interesting what we learn as we continue to explore. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so, um, and then just to round out the conversation, um, a little bit about Klebsiella and Escherichia coli and its association with hydrogen, um, hydrogen positive SIBO, um, and then also disulfibrio species with uh, the hydrogen sulfide um, positive SIBO. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, this new breath test, as you mentioned, the Trio Smart breath test measures all three gases. <clears throat> and what we see is that um, using the breath test, we're actually able to mimic or understand three microtypes in the gut. This was a paper that just came out. So there's the hydrogen microtype, which is mostly bloating, a little bit of change in bowel function. There's the methane microtype, which is the stuff we've been talking about, but more constipated. And then there's the hydrogen sulfide microtype, which is bloating, but more diarrhea and more severe mm -hmm. diarrhea. And we see that the hydrogen sulfide on the breath test predicts the sulfate-reducing bacteria like the sulfovibrio and usobacterium in the bowel. Uh, and, and so we're able to see that the breath test is, in fact, matching what we see in the microbiome of the human and the condition of diarrhea or constipation or bloating. And this is the first time we're able to see that transparently by, by just measuring breath testing. Uh, and uh, that, that's a super important study and uh, hopefully very convincing that breath testing is really important in clinical practice. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I've, I've seen in some of your recent work that you've been incorporating um, your recent research, I should say, incorporating stool testing to help make some correlations or predictions um, like the uh, 16S RNA testing, sequencing testing. Can you uh, let us know just a little about where we're at with using that as a, a to complement um, our physical exam, history taking, um, breath testing? It, is that a is that a piece that we might see be added to the kind of evaluation of an IBS patient? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they're they're let me say it delicately uh, because there's a lot of stool testing out there and a lot of stool testing based on the microbiome. I am not saying that any of that stool testing is wrong. What I'm saying is that we still don't understand all the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so I can't even today with any of the science, tell you for sure in that patient whether that level of M. smithii is the level that causes constipation versus positive methane on the breath test. We've had some work done in that area, and we think the cutoff is 10 to the 4. But some people say, well, any M. smithii is bad. That's absolutely incorrect. We know M. smithii is ubiquitous. Almost everybody has a little bit of it, and it's necessary and good. And may even be anti-inflammatory. We've got one paper saying that higher M. smithii means lower TNF levels in, in the circulation, meaning it's good for you. But you can't have it this high. You can have it this high. So sometimes messing around with testing, not knowing what you're doing, can lead to trouble. We've had some patients where we drop the methane methanogen so low, they start having diarrhea. So... Yeah. And that's not SIBO. It's just an artifact of treatment. And, and so we have to know what we're doing, what we're chasing, and how aggressively to chase it. So uh, the best way to say this in a very simplistic terms is there are no such things as good and bad bacteria. Mm. There is such thing as a balance. And, and knowing that balance is the trickiest part of this whole thing that we haven't gotten there yet. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, methanogens are not bad if they're in the right numbers. E. coli and Klebsiella are not bad if they're in the right place and the right numbers. And they may, in fact, be necessary. Uh, and so let's figure it out and then decide how to handle it. And that's what we're trying to do. Makes a lot of sense. 
So another pillar, you know, kind of moving on to other aspects of this pathophysiology that ends up being IBS or SIBO or EMO is um, the migrating motor complex. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big pillar of treatment and prevention of reoccurrence. Can you talk about any new updates that you've learned about um the uh, migraine motor complex and uh, how we're thinking about it in 2022. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very clear from a number of studies, not lately, but these are a little bit older studies that a lack of migrating motor complex equals um, SIBO, uh, not EMO, not, but SIBO. And uh, so it's important to know that just by changing the bacteria, you're going to make people better and you're going to, they're going to be better for a while. But that lack of cleaning wave, which we think starts from food poisoning, is related to the anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin antibodies to some extent. But that lack of cleaning wave is what's going to bring their overgrowth back. So in patients where they relapse, it's important to keep trying to make that cleaning wave more, to try and encourage that cleaning wave and so that we can get a longer time between, uh, between relapses. In a study we did, oh my gosh, probably 2009, we compared nothing to erythromycin, which at a low dose is a promoter of cleaning waves, to at that time uh, to gasserod, which is similar to what we have now with procalipride. It's the same category, uh, serotonin agonist. And nothing, it was just a few weeks to relapse. With erythromycin, it got you some gain, but with the more aggressive prokinetic, you've got maybe three quarters of a year without relapse. And so that's what we do. We try to give the right treatment for the right patient. I have, look, I have patients where they took antibiotics. I don't see them for two or three years. They yeah. don't relapse. So you don't want to give it to that patient. But that's really 20% of the patients. Uh, the rest of them need something. Yeah, that makes sense. And along those lines are another pillar that um, we talk about is vial acids and um, you know, I, I think one of the first times I got introduced to the importance of bile acids with SIBO was a paper that incorporated rifaximin in combination with gorgum. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like a combo treatment. And I think the proposed mechanism was that it somehow pulled bile acids into the bile acid metabolism into the treatment to help, um, address the SIBO. Uh, I know you've been looking at bile acids recently. Can you share anything about that? For Yeah, I mean, bile acids are extremely complex. Let me start with that. Uh, somebody did a um, mass spec of stool from humans for bile acids and found over a thousand different bile acids. Whoa. <laughs> so uh, I, it's almost a 10 year of study over the next 10 years to try and figure out what's going on exactly. But in general, bile acids are soap. For the gut. So they're soap to help uh, absorb fats and they uh, create these sort of uh, little cells of, of material to bring fat into the body and other, other products. But bile acids also, when they encounter bacteria, certain bacteria, methanogens do this, have bile salt hydrolases that can change the bile salts into nasty bile salts. And some of the nasty mm -hmm. bile salts are irritating and can cause diarrhea. That's called bile salt diarrhea. So, um, but in the terms of guar gum, it could have two effects. It could be bringing bile in like a soap, encouraging bile production. And by doing so, it's like a soap, cleans the bowel a little bit, and, and that's helpful. Uh, but the bacteria, if it converts the bile acids to bad bile acids, that's a bad thing. So sometimes it's, a, it's so you can get one or the other. Um, and... The other thing that guar gum does is guar gum is, is sort of like a fiber. So it can feed the bacteria and fed bacteria are easier to kill. So if you're feeding the bacteria, then instead of being on these restrictive diets, you have a higher chance of getting rid of SIBO because uh, bacteria who are starved are in hibernation. Sometimes they form spores. Sometimes they form specialized membranes to prevent themselves from dying while they wait for food. I see. Yeah, and so there's another big division of um, IBS, which we call, it's called post-infectious IBS. And 
I think 2014 um, was the first time I think one of your updates talked about really um, drilling down the potential mechanism with um, Campylobacter jejuni and um, how that leads to antibodies against Finculin and the development of the IBS smart test. And it, you know, when diagnosing a patient with post-infectious IBS, um, how, how has that conversation changed? Because I, I know the conversation I was having with people in 2014, and I imagine it's much different now, um, now that you've had, you know, seven or eight years of, of data. Yeah, I mean, the first few patients, there was a patient who came to my office, literally she was in tears because her doctors told her she was crazy, that this is not a real disease, that there's nothing that we know that causes IBS. And then here she gets a blood test that says it was food poisoning. And she's like, well, that's what I've been telling my doctors. I had food poisoning ever since then. I haven't been well. And now you have a test that affirmed my what I've been telling the doctor. So, I mean, again, there's always stories behind this. But what's remarkable and will continue to be remarkable, as you'll see in the coming months, we're now able to create these animal models where we just give them the toxin, CDTB, and the animals develop SIBO. They develop the three microtypes, hmm. just like humans, and, and all the changes in the lining of the intestine that are typical of IBS. And so it's, it, this has truly been a really important part of the story. The question is, how do we get those antibodies out of your blood to cure you? Yeah. Because if we do that, we think we can cure you uh, and as a patient. And that's our real focus for the next five years uh, because that could be the game changer, like just curing the patient and maybe indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the one thing that I always point out to people with who had – you know, have IBS and, you know, sort of we're entertaining this question of post-infectious IBS is that it's not like you go to Mexico, get food poisoning and come back and then IBS starts up. It's usually like a, a start, a stop, and then a delay, and then the IBS kicks in, right? Is that still the current thinking? So that's, that's exactly what we see is we see this, um, you get the CDTB going up right away, and the patient starts to get symptomatic. But food poisoning, it's really severe diarrhea. And then after about a week, it seems to settle. And then gradually you start to get these symptoms. Of course, the food poisoning symptoms are here. The IBS symptoms are here, but normal's down below the screen. So um, it's never as bad as the food poisoning. But the, the point is, that you get it's like this and then down and then this up again as a second cycle where the IBS just lasts indefinitely. Uh, yeah, and the an and antibodies match that. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think that in the IBS smart test also has in my in my patient population um, helped people make a decision of whether, you know, they have IBS or if they should pursue further testing with, you know, colonoscopy or other more um, pathology that's related to like IBD, so it's it's been a, it's been really good from a primary care standpoint too. You know, just to. Um, well, the, I think that's oh. I think that's where that the IBS Smart should sit is in primary care because the thing about and we've known this for more than ten years is that a primary care physician, if they have somebody with constipation in their office, they're pretty adept at and they're not going to be adept at emo intestinal methanogen overgrowth but they're going to be adept at treating constipation and they're not stressed out about constipation. But if you put a diarrhea patient in front of a primary care physician who isn't experienced with SIBO and all these things, they're having a little anxiety about this patient because what if it's celiac? What if it's Crohn's disease? What if it's ulcerative colitis? What if it's microscopic colitis? What if it's parasites? On and on and on. But if you did the test and it's positive, you're done. It's IBS treat. Uh, and, and I think that's where, the patient will get benefited faster and less money to the healthcare system if you can do it at that stage. And your yep. doctor's the doctor's comfortable. He says, okay, it's IBS. It's, it's not likely to be anything else. Let's move on. Let's try some IBS therapies rather than being stressed. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me, I when I was just getting further into, you know, wanting to make gastrointestinal gastrointestinal disorders more in my specialty, I went to a board review course. 
um, just to sit in for like three or four days of docs getting ready for their board reviews. I, I signed up for the conference and the, the, um, the SIBO portion was like five minutes. I was, I was so disappointed. And, uh, the constipation versus diarrhea component was a very long segment. And even the, the teacher said, you know, think about constipation and diarrhea a little bit like sitting on the middle of a boat. Like, you know, if, if you're going to rock the boat, if it's rocking one way, you move the other way. <laughs> and uh, there was kind of like diarrhea versus constipation treatments. And then, you know, SIBO was, uh, but that, that was a long time ago. I'm sure it's changed. That was maybe 10 years ago. Well, that's really sad because that's, you know, whenever I talk about the FDA and treatments for IBS, it's not the FDA's fault. The FDA doesn't come up with the treatments. It's the companies. You know, uh, it was a, a race to the bottom uh, for drugs because if you have a patient with diarrhea, you wanted to have the best drug that made them constipated. And if you had a patient with constipation, you wanted the drug that would make them have liquid stools because that one's going right. to win. And that one's going to meet meet the FDA endpoint instead of, well, don't we want to make people normal? Don't we want to keep them in the middle? And there was no drug that brought them to the middle until Rifaximin came up because it was treating, you know, the cause. But this whole boat notion is the reason we're sort of half in this, half been in this mess and patients have been on this, patients have been seasick on this boat. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh I'm glad we're, you know, able to have conversations. I mean, I think people who are really into functional digestive disorders are, you know, really thinking deeply and, you know, sitting in front of patients who are suffering with this, it's, it's often a, um, it's often like a, a silent suffering that a patients have because nobody um, really understands them um, and understands the extent of what it's like to have a digestive tract that's really out of balance. Um, that being said, you know, I, I'm curious about your thoughts with, you know, what makes a good gastro doc? Like wh when you're, you know, what are some of the qualities? Cause I, I think, you know, we have this notion that people just pick a specialty, you know, for, but people who get really good and exceptional at a specialty, I'm sure there's some things that really shine. Um, do you have anything you can share with us about that? Well, I, I I can share what I do and what I think is important as a physician. I mean, look, there's textbooks. Textbooks are always the extreme examples. They're always the extreme examples. When they talk about low thyroid being a cause of constipation, I've never seen it. All I do is treat constipation. I have seen some of the most bizarrely low thyroids and no constipation. So I think what we got into is this sort of it's a bit of mythology of medicine is that back in the day when these textbooks were written and this dogma was created, there was some dude on a farm whose thyroid was so low that he was constipated. And then he comes in, it gets recorded as that. And then it's forever indoctrinated in the medical literature. We don't see that anymore. We don't see the tumor this big on a, on a person's leg because they couldn't leave their job workforce for a year everything we see is this big now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really hard because you can miss things because you're looking for things very, very early now. It's not like it used to be in the, in the old days, as they say. Uh, but what I, what I like in a physician is somebody who's willing to work hard for the patient because you don't, nobody can know everything but you sure can try to know as much as you can to help that patient. So that's the one mm. quality I look for in a physician. Uh, the second is just, I've learned more about what to do in science from my patients than I did in my own mm -hmm. head because, yeah. you know, you're, you're seeing things. You just have to observe and put the pieces together. But the patients are telling you everything. I, 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 can, I, I give you an example. I, I gave a lecture um, and, uh, I can't remember. It was about 10 years ago. It was the first, some of the first Rifaximin lectures I did. And I was in some rural town and this 70 year old doctor gets up and he's 
he's he's old and 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 he looks old and seasoned and, and he says you know what in the 1970s i used to give flagell for this ibs thing and it used to work i'm not surprised i'm not surprised i'm like why didn't you say something you know so yeah. you know they people saw this people thought it was giardia but the tests were negative you know stuff like that um so it's it's funny you just got to be a keen observer and then put the pieces together i think that's what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. makes sense and yeah that's that's really helpful um to hear that and i think you know one of the things that um you know i want to highlight or just kind of that resonates with me is you know the being able to um learn from your patients because you know that that shows a quality of like listening right and being open and and really trying to understand the person who's sitting in front of you and i think uh with with ibs that's so important because it's there's so many different versions of it right it's yeah and the remarkable um, thing about ibs which is also keep makes my me scratch my head there's rare diseases that we know a ton about genetic diseases that maybe happen to one in a million people look at uh gastronomas right you don't yeah. see that very often ibs is everywhere it's 10 percent of the population and nobody was sort of assembling the pieces very well and and uh there's no shortage of suffering you know it's not life-threatening but it's suffering and immense suffering mm -hmm. for these patients. So, mm -hmm. but that's fine. You know, now it's a new day, it's a new age, and hopefully it will continue to improve for these patients. Yeah. So I'd love to finish our conversation just hearing um, a little bit more about the MAST program and um, just how people could support that. I think it's just really fascinating how you're integrating with other specialties um, and really highlighting how the microbiome is interfacing with other um, specialties. Can you talk about that and, and also about your new book? Oh, sure. Um, well, let me start with the book, and then I'll go to the MASP program. So every time I write a book, it's because somebody poked me to write a book. Uh, it's not that I don't like to write books. I just, again, my whole practice, as you've heard me say here, it's not about me. Nothing is about me. I, I, I We even donated the the launch proceeds to the uh, World Health World Kitchen with uh, Jose Andres because he was feeding all the people in Ukraine who were suffering and so forth. Because it's not a this is not about me. This is about patients, but it helps the patient educate themselves, and it helps some physicians who read it understand the next level of nuance. Um, but the MASS program is. Uh, really something that took about 10 years to convince Cedars to do, that we wanted to do a program where we develop things because drug companies weren't. And I think that's what got me. It's this boat analogy you said where you're giving diarrhea drugs to make constipated people better and constipated drugs to make diarrhea patients better, and it's just frustrating. So I said, we have to do something because nobody else is really doing it. So let's see how far we can get. And Cedars uh, got into it, so uh, I'm very happy we're able to do this. But if you think about it, who else is doing IBS pathophysiology research in the United States? It's very few people. And uh, you've got 10% of the human population suffering from a condition and very few people doing the work. NIH doesn't sponsor anything. They don't, you know, I've applied 13 times to the NIH grant. I applied about EMO. Everything in that grant, we eventually did and proved EMO was true. I applied about SIBO. Everything that we put in that grant, we eventually did through blood, sweat, and tears, scraping barrels to get cash to be able to do those, and it worked. I applied about CDTB and Vinculin. All the animal models that we eventually did, the grants never got funded. So we had to, you know, scra scrape together dollars and cents here and there. I'll tell you one story because it's really, I think you'll, your audience will find it interesting. Uh, a randomized control trial to do, let's say, 80 patients in a trial probably costs $2 million. Mm -hmm. The first study we did, we had no money. The first study we did with neomycin and placebo, we bought neomycin and we bought placebo and we just 
did the work, $2,000. Wow. And the neomycin study w- worked. It was a double blind study. And that study started the whole story. So it's just to show you that we, we really were determined to help patients at all, at any cost we could. I mean, just get yeah. it done. Um, and it was an interesting time. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wow. Yeah. What a great uh, story to wrap up with. Um, so um, the uh, if there's any closing parting words you'd like to give us, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank you for your time. And again, you know, so much appreciation um, for what you do. And um, I've helped so many patients because of the work that you do. And it, it's very rewarding to help people and, and see people, you know, move forward and not, not need this type of care anymore. You know, just kind of go out and live their life. That's, that's why I'm in this is I want them to not need me. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, I just want to thank you. And if there's anything else you'd like to leave us with, but this has been wonderful and been uh, just a great experience for me. Thank you. No, I, I've, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and it's been a while. I've known you for a long while, and certainly over yeah. email. So uh, it's been a great experience talking to you today, and great questions as always, as you always give me, you challenge me, and uh, let's do it again. Sounds good. Thank you so much, and um, I hope you have a happy holiday season. You too. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. Please share these episodes with your friends, loved ones, colleagues, patients, healthcare providers, anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if these the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit from that. For the the episode to them and i'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them so once again we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the one thing podcast and again much appreciation for you being here with me